From around the Beltway to around the world, this is The Daily Drum on 96.3 WHUR. Plus, now every Wednesday on WHUT-TV, bringing you the information you need that matters most. Better together. Here's Harold Fisher. Good evening. This is The Daily Drum for Wednesday, November 15th. Here's what's happening. Police in Prince George's County want to know why a 15-year-old student at Bowie High School brought a gun to school yesterday. Bowie Acting Police Chief Dwayne Preston said the teen had a loaded 9mm ghost gun with an extended magazine holding 30 rounds. It appears that at some point throughout the day, he left the school campus and, and then returned uh, to one of those other uh, entryways that was not covered by a metal detector. The student was taken to Cheltenham Youth Detention Center. Charges are pending. The fight over the selection of the new FBI headquarters continues. Virginia's congressional delegation is now calling for an inspector general investigation into how the Greenbelt Maryland site was selected by the GSA last week. The mother of a six-year-old Newport News Virginia boy who shot his teacher has been sentenced to 21 months in prison. The sentence is for marijuana use while owning a gun. Prosecutors say Deja Taylor's son grabbed a gun from her purse and took it to Rich Neck Elementary where he shot and wounded Abby Werner in class. She has a hearing next month on the charges the state has filed against her. Well, do you have $100 to spare? If you don't, stay out of D.C.'s metro bus lanes. Starting today, the district will find drivers who are blocking or driving in the lanes. And after years of planning, a groundbreaking was held today for the Go-Go Museum in Anacostia. Mayor Muriel Bowser and filmmaker Spike Lee attended the ceremony with co-founder and activist Ronald Moten. When your heart is in something, we can do whatever we want to do in this city. And we've got to put our hearts into changing what's going on in our city right now. The museum is scheduled to open in the spring. And don't forget to join WHUR and Sunny and the City tomorrow night from 7 to 9 to kick off the holiday season with Macy's Metro Center. It's the annual holiday window unveiling with the downtown D.C. Business Improvement District. There will be plenty of family activities and giveaways. Easy Street will be spinning your favorite holiday music. Here's a look at the weather now. Cloudy overnight with lows in the mid to upper 30s tomorrow. Lots of sunshine. Highs around 70 degrees. Yes, it is the middle of November. Coming up, dealing with grief, PTSD, bad news, and other mental health issues. We're talking to the therapist tonight. Lines are open. Give us a call, 202-319-7810. 202-319-7810. Insight is next on WHUR and WHUT-TV. On the go and on demand, WHUR and WHUT are with you. Download the WHUR app today to get full access to shows, playlists, and our latest contests. To access WHUT on demand, download the PBS app and make Howard University Television your station. Catch up on our WHUT original productions anytime, anyplace on YouTube at WHUT TV. WHUR and WHUT better together. D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, you might have noticed something a little different on Monday nights at 8 p.m. I'm Angie Ange, our director of content here at WHUT. And Monday nights at 8 p.m., we like to call it Must See DMV. All your favorite shows from all your favorite creators focus solely on what makes D.C., Maryland, and Virginia so special. So set your clock, and we'll catch you at 8 p.m. right here on WHUT, Howard University Television, telling your stories on your station. Welcome back to The Daily Drum on WHUR, WHUT-TV, Sirius XM Channel 141, 96.3 HD2, and 98.3 FM. This is the Insight Segment. I'm Harold Fisher. Tonight, we are talking to the therapist. After all, it is the season to really focus on mental health. The holidays can be very difficult for loved ones who are dealing with grief and loss, But we're also living in a season of gun violence. What impact does that have on the mental health 
of our children. Well, those are just a few of the issues we'll be talking about tonight with our therapists. My guests are licensed professional counselor, Dr. Nikisha Riggins, and Dr. Danielle Hairston, psychiatry residency program director at the Howard University College of Medicine. They are answering our therapy questions and yours. Lines are open. Give us a call at 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. You can also X me at H Fisher W H U R, or you can find me on Instagram at Harold T. Fisher. Dr. Harrison, Dr. Riggins, thank you so much for joining the conversation. Thank you for thank having you. us. Let me first start with something that has been in the headlines, and that has to do with gun violence. But specifically, and I'll start with you, Dr. Harrison. As you know, yesterday, a 15-year-old boy was arrested at Bowie High School for allegedly bringing a ghost gun to school. 30 rounds in an extended magazine. That is not new. We are having issues with gun violence in our young people but I, I want to specifically ask about the impact on young people who are not bringing guns to school, but who are exposed to this kind of violence. From your perspective, what kind of concerns about their mental health uh, do you have? My first concern is trauma. I mean, there's a lot to unpack, right? Like a ghost gun. Where did you get this from? Mm -hmm. Who ordered this? Why did you have this clip of 30 rounds? Like, what was the plan? But also realize that just sitting next to someone or being in the same school or walking past this person in the hallway is traumatic. There's a lot to consider. You know that PTSD, yes, we know it impacts adults. People usually think about PTSD with veterans and going through war. But this can also result in PTSD for children so it's really important that we pay attention to how they're moving to what they're saying to what they're not saying because it's definitely has an impact and trauma can impact anything it can impact their sleep it can impact anxiety depression so even what they eat so it's important that we really pay attention to how they're reacting and how they're moving after experiencing this you know I would imagine just thinking about being in class with someone, I mean, yeah, I was in class a long, long time ago, but still, the the thought that if this person was sitting next to me yesterday or the day before, and I had, you know, a good relationship with this person, good classmate, what have you, and then for this to happen the day after, I would need to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what kind of things might be going through a child's mind, particularly with, the, you know, the recent history in this country of, you know, school shootings and the like, that, that kind of thing would really put me on edge, Dr. Riggins. Mm -hmm. As you were talking, I was thinking about how so many of these situations begin to rob children of this childhood joy, their ability to have fun, relax, not be concerned about what used to be adult issues, to be able to have school and the pathway to school feel like a safe space. And so when I think about what adults and even older children can say to younger children, I think it's important to encourage them to consider other safe spaces, other places where they can continue to have joy be age appropriate, find places and people at school where they can have open conversations. It may not be the teacher, it may not be the guidance counselor, but ideally there is someone within their community that they can say, express whatever their concerns are and find someone who can help them talk through whatever is, is bothering them so that the anxiety, the depression, the PTSD that was mentioned does not necessarily have to happen what do you recommend to a parent who has their child now come home and the child is saying you won't believe what happened today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are our children numb to this now is is that is that part of the impact or are they in another sense hypersensitive to this 
I don't think children are numb to it. I don't think we should allow children to become numb to it. Mm -hmm. And what parents need to do is talk to them, even if they don't want to talk. Even if they say, I don't want to talk about it, find a way. Like, text them. Mm -hmm. Or, let's go out to get something to eat. Are you thinking about anything? What are you thinking? What are your feelings? And also, always know that it is always appropriate to include a professional. If you feel like your child is changing, usually when we see behavioral acting out, when we see um, children start to become isolative, they don't want to engage, they don't talk, when you start to see those things, make sure you're paying attention to, to those nonverbal cues. Because mm -hmm. they might not say, they say, they'll say everything is fine, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is fine. No, I don't want to talk about it, mm -hmm. but are they engaging? Do they still want to do stuff with their friends? Are they saying they have a stomach ache and they can't go to school? Mm -hmm. Are they trying to find a way to avoid engaging, avoid a way, find a way to not go to class, not go to after school activities, not engage? So pay attention to those nonverbal cues as well as asking them what's going on and always it's appropriate to include a professional. Mm -hmm. if to, I get, oh, no, go ahead, please. I would also <laughs> add to... as. As you're paying attention to those things, I would also say to be aware that these symptoms may show up later. They don't necessarily need to show up that day or even the next day, but it could be a while before. A month. A month, months even, before the child recognizes that, oh, wait, I was actually sitting next to this person. What if that were me? Those are thoughts that don't have to come right away. So how might that present a month later or two months later it's mm -hmm. it's one thing if that child is sitting at home playing video games and and the parent may think okay it's blown over mm -hmm. everything is fine and then they're playing i don't know grand theft auto or whatever kids play these days and they realize that this is a game but this really isn't a game mm -hmm. how do you know and how might you approach a child when these things present later? Because parents, you know, parents are parents. It's like, okay, kid's fine. It's been a week. It's been two weeks. My child is fine. We're good. But these things could show up later. Mm -hmm. I think it's always important to keep the lines of communication open. So, yes, on the day of, bring it up couple weeks later still bring it up let your child know or your children know that you're here if you have a thought you have a concern I'm here and also as was shared pay attention to if the sleep patterns change there's um, a decrease in a desire to participate in things that used to bring joy if they're avoiding things those are all wonderful signs to pay attention to and bring that up to your child. They may not recognize it, but say, hey, you know, I've noticed you, you haven't been sleeping well. You maybe haven't been eating well. Is there something that, that we could talk about or even present solutions? Because they're young. They may not recognize that this is something that um, is a concern and they there are options to get help. 202-319-7810. 202-319-7810. This is Ask the Therapist. The doctors are in. We are talking about all kinds of uh, mental health issues. If you have a comment, if you have a question about something that uh, may be affecting you, maybe it could be something that has to do with the season, grief, loss, stress. We're going to be tackling all of those issues tonight. So lines are open again. Give us a call at 202-319-7810. 202-319-7810. Here's the thing. Uh, therapy can be expensive, so here's your chance to get some therapy. <laughs> Marie, <laughs> if you can. You know, one of the other things that has been uh, top of mind, and, and I think we saw a little bit of a sigh of relief. It's not a done deal yet, but over the past month and a half has been the stress that has been created by the thoughts of of the government shutdown. Mm -hmm. And the DC is a federal city. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of of federal workers in in the DMV. And we have been through this before. It has been very traumatic. It has been terribly difficult. Of course, there was a continuing resolution about 45 days ago, and then just last night, Congress, uh, the House, approved a continuing uh, resolution. The Senate still has to vote. 
Today is Wednesday. We have two more days to get through this. My goodness, how do you address the stress? I think you said something that was very powerful. We have been through this before. Mm -hmm. We've been through it and we are here. And oftentimes I talk to my clients about, okay, so what have you gone through that is similar that maybe you can draw some lessons learned from? And for those people, whether they personally or know someone who has gone through it, I think it could be important to um, reflect on that and also plan, consider what you have control over. We can't control directly what the government does, but there are other things that we could do so that we have a sense of control over what is coming down the pike. Your, your thoughts about that? I think it's expected that we have this anxiety, this fear. Um, we know what can happen. We've mm -hmm. seen it go either way. Like We've seen people come out of it, but we've also seen people not be able to work and not be able to feed their families and not be able to do basic things that they need. So I think we have to understand and accept that this is stressful. We can't act like it's not going on. I think that's really important to be authentic. Like this is happening. It is impacting me. I want to talk about it. Um, I'm not going to act like it's not here. And I think the DC government, the federal government, whoever it is, has to recognize that your employees are going through this. Like, don't mm -hmm. act like, oh, it's just another day. It's another day of uncertainty, and people can become consumed by this. Like, I can have difficulty sleeping, I can have palpitations, I can be not able to eat, I can have a decrease in interest in things because I'm so consumed by this fear. So we really need to talk about it, really need to discuss it. And I think leadership needs to discuss it and acknowledge this. Like, yes, it's a D.C. thing. We know there's other federal centers around this oh, yeah. uh, around this country, but we have to acknowledge that this is something that's going on and we, we have to be transparent and acknowledge it. Not to mention the fact that Thanksgiving is next week. Right, so can I buy the food for right. my family? <laughs> yes. And yes. and the next week, in the next mm -hmm. week, if you celebrate, if you choose to celebrate Christmas, can I get these gifts? Like, I need to plan forward. And when you're consumed by uncertainty, by the fear of what's going to happen, that brings a lot of stress. And mm -hmm. I think it needs to be recognized and acknowledged. Like, this isn't just people playing around, you know, um, in Congress. Y'all are arguing back and forth. We see you. But this is my life that's going to be impacted. And we have to really acknowledge that this is a real thing. You know, I remember remember about a, a month or so ago when this issue came up and I was soliciting donations for this domestic violence uh, event that I was participating in and I reached out to one of my really good sister friends and I said look you know I'd, I'd like to have a donation from you and she's a fed she works for the federal government that's been her entire career and she said I would love to but right now i I don't know if I'm going to get paid this right. week. And I can't imagine the amount of stress. And, and that's workplace-related mm -hmm. stress. That is your livelihood. So, I mean, short of taking a bubble bath, <laughs> you know, how, how do you woo-saw when you've got that kind of pressure? I definitely think awareness, awareness of the stress, being able to talk about it, name it, recognize what you're feeling, where you're feeling it in your body, and also, as you said, talking about it at work, at home, so that you're not feeling alone. When people um, go through things and feel alone, it causes it to feel even deeper, it can cause it to feel even worse. And just knowing that you're not alone can, can often help. Let me go to the phone lines, 202-319-7810. 202-319-7810. We are talking to the therapist tonight. If you have an issue that you need help addressing, uh, give us a call. Lines are open. Let's talk to Linda. Linda calling from Virginia. Linda, thanks for calling. What's on your mind? Linda, are you there? Linda, give us a call back if you can. Let's go to Lagosu calling from D.C. Lagosu, thanks for calling. What's on your mind? Hi there. Um, I want to keep it brief, but sure. I just wanted to say I really appreciate you, Kojo, uh, talking about this topic. Yeah, and this is Harold. Kojo Namdi has not been here in decades, but go right ahead, Lagosu. Oh, my bad. That, 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 that's all right. We, 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 we look so much alike. 
bad, my bad. Anyway, I just wanted to say thank you for having the therapist on. Sure. Um, and to go back to your point about um, the children at the school, um, I personally, I'm 34. I've been in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy myself for about six years, and I'm just now uncovering some of the post-traumatic stress from when I was a child. I'm talking about a toddler, five years old. Um, so if anybody's listening uh, who's, you know, um, in a relationship with those children who are at that school, yes, please talk to them. Please get them some, some professional help as soon as possible, um, and for the families, too. Um, that kind of trauma, um, it just sends ripples, like, through a, f- a family tree. Um, so, like I said, I want to keep it brief. Thank you all for doing what you do. Um, and, uh, yeah, have a great rest of your night. I'm enjoying the conversation. Lagosu, thank you so much for your phone call. Uh, Dr. Harrison, what is cognitive behavioral therapy? Cognitive behavioral therapy, also known as CBT for short, is a type of therapy when uh, you try to encourage people to think through their problems and uh, address things like automatic thinking, negative thoughts, like how if I go through something, how can I cope? If I go through this, how can I make sure that I'm not overreacting, that I'm not overwhelmed by my thoughts? And it can... It can be for a few months, it can be for eight sessions, or it could be for 10 years. It depends on who you are and what you really need to process. And I appreciate that Logosu, you know, brought up being in therapy and going through things as a child because trauma is not just one person. Right. Mm -hmm. So generational trauma, we see historical trauma, we see. So if we don't process things and we learn these maladaptive behaviors to keep them to yourselves, to not discuss them, and then you you push that onto your children, then nothing is addressed. And you end up with children who carry trauma from, yes, their own experiences, from their parents' experiences, from their grandparents' experiences, and it's generational and it can be community. So I appreciate that he brought that up and it's really something to address because I think a lot of times people are like, well, kids, especially black kids, are resilient. Kids can get through this. They won't remember, but they will remember. And then they become the adults that I see in the emergency room every day. This brings up something and 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 tell me if if this is what Lagosu was talking about. A um, couple of weeks ago, I was in a parking lot and just going to grab something to eat. Well, when I got my food and I got in my car and I realized that I was being blocked in. And the driver of the car was a mother with a young child. I guess she was eight or nine. And I went back into the store and I said, you know, you know, sis, you're uh, you're blocking me in. And she said, okay, I'll and I'll come out. Very nice person. But when I walked out and she walked out with her child, she was yelling and cursing at her child. Mm-hmm. And I and I was thinking to myself. Oh my God, just, she was, get in the car, hurry up, that, you know, and is that the kind of thing that you're talking about when you're talking about trauma and addressing these kinds of issues? Yeah, um, mm-hmm. her mother might have talked to her like that, and her mother might have talked to her like that, and it was normalized as this is how you talk to children, this is how you parent. I literally just... I was saying flew back from Jamaica and I was in the airport and a mom was just yelling at her child about how she was going to beat her and cussing at her and everyone was looking and I'm here, you know, on vacation, but I'm still here as a psychiatrist, as a therapist. That doesn't change. It doesn't change. And all I can think about is this is so triggering for everyone here. This is traumatic for this child, for her siblings, for everyone who's around. And this might be how this person's mother talked to them or how this person's partner talked to them but they have to understand what your what the impact of how you speak how you treat your children how you interact how you communicate is having on your children Mm -hmm. i want to hold your point because i do want to drill down a little bit more because this is really fascinating to me because obviously there's a lot of anger out there Mm -hmm. and that is again something that is not new but maybe as part of this discussion, we can look at other ways uh, to address it. D, calling from Maryland. Alana, calling from Maryland. Desi, calling from D.C. Stay with us. Do not hang up. The Daily Drum will continue on Sirius XM Channel 141 and WHUT 
TV. I'm Harold Fisher. John Mons is next with the original Quiet Storm. That's going to be on WHUR-FM. We will be back with more of a conversation with our therapist, asking the therapist. Lines are still open at 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. We'll be back in just a bit. On the go and on demand, WHUR and WHUT are with you. Download the WHUR app today to get full access to shows, playlists, and our latest contests. To access WHUT on demand, download the PBS app and make Howard University Television your station. Catch up on our WHUT original productions anytime, anyplace on YouTube at WHUT TV. WHUR and WHUT better together. D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, you might have noticed something a little different on Monday nights at 8 p.m. I'm Angie Ange, our director of content here at WHUT. And Monday nights at 8 p.m., we like to call it Must See DMV. All your favorite shows from all your favorite creators focus solely on what makes D.C., Maryland, and Virginia so special. So set your clock, and we'll catch you at 8 p.m. right here on WHUT, Howard University Television, telling your stories on your station. Welcome back to The Daily Drum on Sirius XM Channel 141 and WHUT-TV. I'm Harold Fisher. We're talking to the therapist tonight about various mental health issues. My guests are licensed professional counselor Dr. Nikisha Riggins and Dr. Danielle Harrison, psychiatry residency program director at the Howard University College of Medicine. They are answering our therapy questions and yours. Lines are open at 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. You can X me at H Fisher W H U R or you can find me on Instagram at Harold T Fisher. By the way, if you're having difficulty getting through, please keep calling. I promise I will get to uh, all of your phone calls before 8 o'clock. A lot of people on the line, lots to talk about. Be- before the break, you know, Dr. Riggins, we were talking about, what? It, uh, what is it again? C- CBT. 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 Um, and Lagosu was saying that he had been in therapy mm-hmm. in, in, in that CBT um, uh, form of treatment. But what might, why would someone have to go into that kind of treatment? I, I, I wish he was still there. I could have asked him if he were willing to share. But he was very open with the fact that he was uh, in, that, in that treatment or had been a part of that, you know, that treatment. Why would someone be in that? Mm-hmm. Oftentimes people come to therapy not knowing what the root cause is. As he said, he had been in therapy for six years before this childhood trauma surfaced. So it could be that maybe there were repeated uh, romantic failed relationships and he's wanting to know what's going on. It's maybe about me and I would like to address that or issues at work. And over time, as these present day things are being addressed and as he feels comfortable in the therapeutic space, recognizing, oh, okay, this this isn't about today, this isn't about last year, but about decades ago, that something big has happened and I need to work through it in order to feel um, the present day release. Mm, interesting. Let me go back to the phone lines, 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. Desi calling from DC. Desi, thanks for calling, what's on your mind? Good evening, um, uh, everyone. Uh, I was thinking, and I've been um, close to the K-12 um, students uh, in our city. And, you know, I'm thinking that everybody cannot even afford um, therapy. But I'm thinking, you know, in a better world, we would have um, licensed um professionals uh, at schools to help with conflict resolution. I think there's, there's a, that's an area that is not being addressed um, in terms of being able, able to help, you know, our 
you know, five-year-old in school, uh, you know, just like they used to have, uh, sadly, just like they used to have home ec and whatever. I think we're at a place now where we need something in place, not just a nurse, but we need to have someone on site or some kind of program implemented in the curriculum. Um, so great we, we do have, mm-hmm. well, I can say here at Howard University Department of Psychiatry, we have a grant from the city. So we do have some school based programs uh, at several different um, at several different schools here. And it is important because we know that tension, that anger, that stress is palpable, you know, I don't even know if, like you said, I don't even know if I can beep at this person just to go in traffic, if it's going to result in someone pulling out a gun or cussing me out or wanting to fight me. Um, So it conflict resolution is important. Like, if I get mad at this person at school, are they going to bring a gun in here? If I say something they don't like, are they going to start to bully me? So these things are very important. There are school-based programs. There are school-based therapists. However, there are not enough. There are not enough, and they are easily overwhelmed. There might be one therapist or two therapists for an entire school. And how can they manage all of this conflict, all of this angst, all of this stress, all of this depression, all of this anxiety? So I agree with you. It is something that should be funded. I do appreciate that the D.C. Department of Behavioral Health is funding some of these programs here, but I just, we need more. We need more people who look like us, who can identify and talk to our children. Desi, thank you so much for your phone call. Dr. Harrison, to that point, what happened? (laughs) You know, and I I say what happened because I remember when I was in, in grade school, when there was conflict, we didn't, we had counselors, but we didn't see the counselors to deal with it. We dealt with it in the principal's office. Or you dealt with it on the playground. Mm -hmm. Well, no. and, And this is why I say no. Because, no, you fought on the playground. Mm -hmm. That's why you were dragged into the principal's office or a teacher. And sometimes counselors would deal with it. But it was, I I just remember, junior high school. We didn't have middle school back in the Flintstone days. But, you know, but I remember we had a principal, Mr. Hawkins, and, and he sat us down and he said, what's wrong with you? What happened? What was said? And... And there was a short conversation, I don't know, 20 minutes. And and he said, well, that's ridiculous. And we understood, even at that young age, that it was ridiculous. What has changed? So, so what he did, he asked you, what happened? Right. What's going on? Mm-hmm. He didn't uh, call the police. No. He didn't have the police come and arrest you as a five or six year old uh, in your school. Well, it was junior high school, but still, yeah. But, or a, yeah, or a 12, 13, or a 12 right year old. They yeah. didn't, he didn't have the police come and um, arrest you, put you in uh, handcuffs, send you straight to the carceral system as a young black male. He didn't do that. He asked the question that needs to be asked. Um, what's going on with you or what happened to you? And I think that we aren't asking that question. It's now like a punitive thing. Well, if you're acting up, I'm, so, I'm sure you've seen on social media kids being handcuffed, kids being arrested mm-hmm. by the police. The questions aren't being asked. There's also, and I have to say that I am a fan and a supporter of social media used in the right way, but there's also social media, there's bullying, there's people not even going to the principal or to the therapist or to the or to the teacher or the counselor they're doing it directly to each other bullying each other on social media is readily available and always in their face i'm interested in hearing what dr riggins thinks. yeah i had somewhat of a visceral response to what you said when i think about principals i think that they are trained for other things other than teaching and managing children around social emotional well-being and so for me that's the place of a counselor i do think principals are important and can assist with that i did not hear you say that the principal asked about how you all were feeling or no and and and, 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 let, and let's drill down a little bit on that no he did he didn't ask how we were feeling he asked what was wrong or what's what, going on? What what mm-hmm. what happened? And he talked about my mama, and I talked about his mama, 
okay, mm-hmm. and then somebody kicked sand, and then and that that's when it, and then it it, it realized that we got to the point, and and again we're talking about a long time ago in a galaxy far far away, which goes back to the point that I was saying about, you know what happened because he was able to reason with two two dirty little black boys hmm. and make us understand leave you leave each other alone okay and because i like i said i this was me i was in that office and they didn't call my mother i didn't get in house detention it was it was a conversation and he reasoned with us and made us realize that what we were doing was was a waste of time needless stupid whatever description and so it didn't get to the point where we needed to sit down on someone's couch and i'm not against that now because it looks like there there needs to be so much more but which goes back to i ask a third time what has happened? I think now there's more an awareness that children have just as many feelings as adults do. And I know earlier you made the comment that when trauma happens as a child, those are the adults that you see, the untreated trauma. So when I think about children who maybe have an altercation at school, they perhaps don't know that this thing has caused such a big feeling in them and they're stuffing it. They're recognizing that this person that they're talking to can't truly support whatever it is that they're feeling inside or maybe they just don't know because it hasn't hit them yet. And by the time it has hit, they don't have a person to speak to about it or they don't recognize that there is a safe space even if there is one. And then they grow up and they then become adults who still need to process that thing that happened when they were a child. Yeah, because I I, I really think, and again, uh, that was then and this is now and and quite honestly the the issues of based on what you're sharing are much more complex than just two boys shading each other doing the dozens talking about each other's mother there there are so many other things that that require much more a multi-layered approach, as you said, as opposed to not just the principal, but the counselor, bringing the parents in, all of that. This is a mental health issue as opposed to just, the, you know, your, your basic uh, two boys knocking heads. Something to think about. Let me go back uh, to the phone lines, 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. D, calling from Maryland. D, thanks for calling. What's on your mind? Um. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. The, you know, people give you advice, but I want to hear an exact number, an exact address to go to when people need mental health help. I just don't know where to look for it in the yellow pages. I mm. just, you know, we, the knowledge seems to be, I'm not easily, you know, found. I can't find some of these things. Where do I go get the help I need or for my children? Dr. Harrison, you first. So the yellow pages, I'm hoping you mean now like Google, but the the main thing that, you know, was launched over a year ago is the 988 number, the 988 number for emergencies for mental health issues. But also if you're saying like, I don't have this crisis right now, but where can I go? I don't have this crisis right now. How can y'all help me? And that's supposed to be uh, the go-to resource, 988, like 911, but 988 for mental health. Also, if you have the privilege, and understand I'm saying the privilege of being insured, because we know that insurance is a privilege. We know that therapy is even a privilege. Getting a, being able to see a psychiatrist is a privilege. If you have that, your insurance companies, call them and tell them, I pay all this money every single paycheck, I need help, and I want to see someone who looks like Dr. Riggins. I want 
a black therapist who understands trauma, who has natural hair, whatever it is, say that, and this is what I need to be able to survive. And I pay for this insurance and it's their job to help find someone for you and someone who's in network so that you're not paying these huge amounts out of pocket. So lean on your insurance. Also 988 is a resource. Mm -hmm. I tried that and, and thank you for sharing that. And they do call and they do, do like, you know, like respond back to you and say how so-and-so is doing after, let's say, an episode has occurred. But um, you know how you got the number for poison and you get the number for the fire department? It seems like to me, other than that 988, it should be a local number where you could catch a bus or taxi or drive to go to that address to say, where it's like, Every place always has a waiting list. Every place yes. does have a waiting list, waiting unfortunately. Lists are long. They're, and they're it's very... real long, like you and back look. We used to could get knowledge from the front porch where people would exchange information and years of knowledge would be, you know, passed out. But there's no more front porches. And everybody's not into the university of Google. So D, so D, that. let me let me suggest this. Um, first of all, how old are you? How old I am? Yes, ma'am. Pretty old senior citizen. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a citizen, senior citizen. Some folks can't say that, um, but but you do have. I, I would imagine you do have a doctor for some of the the physical issues that you. Yeah, I, I, it's the, it's my it's my grandchildren. Right. Well, talk to your doctor. Okay. If, you know your 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 physician. You know if if your back hurts, if your foot hurts, if you if he or she is is telling you you need to eat better, exercise, what have you, that your doctor can also make a recommendation and point you in the direction regarding any mental health issues that you may be challenged with or that your children or grandchildren that that's what they're there for they're not just there to help you overcome the flu they are there as as a resource for you and to that point if there's a younger person that you do trust i'm certain that they would also be able to point you in the right direction or help you google this information because um just because you are an older person doesn't mean that you should not have access to the best health care available. So, um, D, keep oh, that in mind. Yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, I do. But D, keep that in mind, and we wish you the best of health. Thank you so much for your phone call. Uh, 202-319-7810. 202-319-7810. Alana calling from Maryland. Alana, thanks for calling. What's on your mind? So my question is, what about, like, me, I never had therapy before. So I will always find a solution to deal with whatever's going on, whether it's job loss, problems, whatever. But my question is, how is that affecting my kids? Would they use that same behavior as life decided to turn for them? Um, what advice would they give to me in that situation? Because I've I've been through a whole lot of stuff, but I've always find a way to deal with whether it's exercising, whether it's running, whether it's walking, whether it's yoga. But with my kids, now they're growing up in this, you know, this world and all these stuff that's happening. I'm noticing they are like taking my pattern. They're like shutting people out. Hmm. And that is why I'm like, you know, they were like, you know, mom, you know what I noticed today? Somebody did this. You know what time is it for them? And I'd be like, what? time to not deal with them ever again those behaviors not what we pertain to me is that bad for them for me i seem it's like they're seeing the problem before it gets worse um because that's what i do i naturally just once stuff is start coming and i feel like oh it's, it's getting overloaded how can i separate it how can i not put them together well let and me see alana let me see what our guests have to say any thoughts about what alana is asking it sounds like you you have an awareness that what you're doing is impacting your children in a way that you don't like and and you're looking for a better way um i 
do know that therapy can be helpful and I'm also aware that if I could ask okay <laughs> um, I'm wondering what patterns you have noticed around what what leads you to separate from from people I think she was saying um, her like, children like separate I'm from saying people. like um, like say for instance dishonesty um, like if you come around and like say for instance if, if my child went to school where a kid had bring home a gun we would move from that school just it's like we constantly, we just separate ourselves. That's what I've been doing, but I notice they're doing that now. Even with friends, they're like separating themselves. And I mean, I don't know if it's affecting them as they get older. It's working for me because I cannot, not every day you can maintain all these pressures that's coming for you. So you have to find a way, it's like a puzzle. So my way is like once I see that you're going on a path that is not working for me, I'm going to cut you off. Mm. They're like similarly doing the same thing. Like, oh, I was in school today, and this guy offered me something to smoke. Oh, I don't even want—I don't even want to be around there anymore, Mom. I'm—I'm I'm done. I don't want—I don't want to call. I'm cutting them off. So I don't know. I'm figuring they're looking at me and adapting that. And I'm not sure if it's gonna hurt them as we go forward. I mean, for me, it's just naturally—I'm just—I can't take about so much. So I'm gonna to have to put some of the puzzle in the corner and cut you off. Sounds like she's talking about like, boundaries. Right. So I was, I was gonna say, I was gonna some say boundaries that. are just healthy and it's okay to separate right. yourself from people who are are harming you or your children in some way. Right. So it sounds like the, a mix what I'm hearing and Hold on for Alana, go right ahead, Doctor Harrison. I it sounds like a mix of different ways to cope with things and there are coping with things differently is appropriate. Every way the way that I cope is not the same way that you cope. So doing yoga, doing exercise, walking, running, mm -hmm. all appropriate. Having strong and healthy boundaries, all appropriate. Like, I'm not going to engage with this person. Um, and then therapy is also appropriate. But yes, your children are seeing how you manage things. And there's extremes. Like, well, if someone makes me upset, we're going to remove them from that school. Like, that might not be the response that we need to have here. But if someone makes me upset, what am I going to do to manage this to cope with that that's when something like cbt therapy comes into place or that's when something like exercise where i'm going to just process it um mindfulness is another thing that people like to do like how can i separate myself from this moment and remember and come back to who i am and ground myself so yes and so yes you should have boundaries and you should also have other ways to cope with things it's not a one-stop shop like I don't want to do yoga. I don't want to do yoga. That's not for me. But I have uh, I go on walks around here all the time when someone is stressing me out. That's my coping. I'll go on a walk, see what gentrification they're doing over here in Shaw. And, <laughs> and I put on my music and I take my break. But then I don't have to come back and say, I'm never talking to y'all again. I'm just going to try to meet people where they are and know that I have this boundary that I'm going to have to step away. So everything in moderation, but not to the extreme dreams yeah uh, alana thank you so much for your phone call a uh, 202-319-7810 202-319-7810 joe calling from maryland thanks for calling joe what's on your mind um yeah i was calling about the uh, grief during the holiday sure um i lost my wife a year or two ago oh we're sorry, sorry to hear that the holidays have always been kind of a rough time for me anyway but now dealing with that and being in the house by myself, it just it just seems even rougher. And you reach out to people, people say, Well, just give me a call, you need to talk and, but people have their own lives. They have things going on with their lives and they can't always talk when you need to talk. And it just leaves me sometimes it leaves me in I don't know, feeling like a little turmoil or something. You know. Mm. I don't know. Just trying to get through the holidays. Dr. Riggins. First, I, I do want to acknowledge that grief is hard. It's it's not something that comes with a timeline. It doesn't um it, it doesn't have a particular pathway that it takes. And so right. I think knowing that and going into the, the holiday season um can be helpful and being aware that yes there's community but also um 
thinking about about what kinds of things maybe you can do and begin to accept within yourself um, to to plan for this season coming up. So what that, might those things be? What would you recommend? I would have a conversation and say, okay, what, what kinds of things bring you joy? What kinds of times of day or locations tend to trigger you? And work with him to come up with a plan so that um, you said that there are times when you reach out to people and they, they, they are not available. But if you know yeah. that perhaps maybe you and your wife had a particular evening or morning routine and the, that specific time is notably difficult for you to maybe beforehand, it when possible, make an arrangement either with yourself or with someone else so that it's not... Um, catching someone else off guard that you're reaching out to or even yourself. Right. What, uh, what impact, do you have family in the area, Joe? I do. What impact might connecting with family during this time have on, on um, and helping I mean, him through that? It depends. Right. It, it depends just on the thinking family. about the boundaries, it yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that they are good people and help, and and would be a safe place for you, would you recommend that he be a part of, of that, particularly during that during this holiday season? Quite possibly. I, I think it definitely needs a maybe bigger conversation though, because being with family, being <clears throat> excuse me, at a particular house or event can be even more triggering. So perhaps it could be that it's a season to create a new tradition, maybe spending the holiday or part of the day with friends or outside or doing yoga, whatever other coping thing that can bring a sense of release and a sense of peace versus, um, I don't know, some people decorate their Christmas tree after a meal and like, okay, maybe I can eat with you, but I can't do that other activity with the family because that's a little too much. I would say that this is busy season for me this is going to be the heavy season starting with the holidays um all the way through Definitely. the end of winter a lot of times people think oh the holidays bring me joy like i'm excited but that's not for everyone like sometimes it triggers memories conversations um past traumas and things like that it's also dark like it's dark at five what, 515 mm, yes. out here mm -hmm. and seasonal affective disorder is a real thing so sometimes people need light boxes sometimes people need some brightness um, that they have to sit with just to bring you back to where you would like to be so it's important for us to understand that this is happening and building community I know we said but building community is important and building community with intention so not just one person I might call, but a group of people I might call. And I might not just say, oh, can I sit and talk with you? I might say, like, can we all go out for, like, brunch? I don't know if I feel like doing, like, the whole dinner, but can we go out for brunch? Or can we go out and do this on a different day? And also, yes, it's important to have your friends. Yes, it's important to have your family. But it's also important for you to have someone who's a professional to talk to. I don't just lean on them because like you said a lot of people have different problems and have different things their own lives going on but is it time for me to join a group is it time for me to engage in group therapy is it time for me to talk to a counselor a grief counselor it's not ne it's never too late like oh this happened two years ago I can't talk about my grief anymore like it's always appropriate that to reach out when you need that help the in in my you know in in, in my therapy degree <laughs> you know um, it, it sounds to me as if at, at least in one sense or another outside of formal therapy that some kind of emotional distraction away from the dark space because Joe said just now he said well we get around this time and and the and Joe, you know, the loss of your wife, it, it's still very, very fresh. It, it's only been what two years, right? Uh, but to be around the emotional light space, mm -hmm. um, is is that, for lack of a, a better term, is that a distraction towards healing? How would you describe that? Well, I actually belong to a men's group, men's group. for grieving. Mm -hmm. Good. 
But the problem with that is our group, we had our last session the other day, and we not we don't start back until January. Mm. And it's like, uh, dude, I really need y'all now. <laughs> yeah. But can you reach out informally? Can you send a right. text? Well, to I, the am. Group? I am. Yeah, I am, because um, I'm still in touch with the facilitator and a couple of guys in the group. Yeah. Okay. But we all kind of felt the same way. It's like, this is not the time for us to have a break. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right, right. Well, uh, Joe, I, I appreciate you, you you reaching out, and as uh, the experts here suggested, de- you know, definitely reach out to you know to those that you can support or that can support you. But also, if there is that light space, that that space of joy, that that piece of joy that you can um, find during this time on the road uh, to healing. It, it it may be a difficult road, it may be a long road, but stay on the road to healing. Right. Yeah, right. We, we wish you absolutely the very, very best. Thank you so much for giving us a call. Uh, quickly, let me go to Kenneth. Kenneth calling from DC. Kenneth, thanks for calling. What's on your mind? Uh, yeah, um, I'm calling because um, earlier you were talking about uh, trauma affecting children yeah and we, we also talked about um things being passed along uh from uh grown up to to children um when i was very young i was in an abusive home where my father abused my mother uh we eventually got away from that but i may have been traumatized and then later um my wife passed away and left me with two boys, and I I don't I I, I think I'm well adjusted, but I'm not sure if I passed any trauma to them because now I notice that my kids kind of my 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 number two son he he kind of self medicates he, mm. he he smokes a joint on the way home. So Kenneth, you know, I, I'm I'm low on time. Really quick, what's your question? My, my question is. What can a family do? Because I'm afraid that we are going to pass this on to my grandson. What can a family do to try to resolve all the trauma and so that everybody can grow up to be well-adjusted? Mm. Uh, r- real quick, Dr. Harrison. Um, a family can talk about it. That's the first thing you can do is talk about it. Like, do you notice that uh, maybe your dad, what do you notice he does? What are his activities? Obviously, I'm not y'all's therapist or psychiatrist, but the way to start is asking and talking about it. Don't wonder, like, I wonder if it, this is impacted. I wonder if this has some type of effect. Actually ask them, address it, figure out what they're thinking, watch them, monitor them. Do they also seem like they're, oh, okay, this is what we're going to do. Okay, that's what we do to get through things. Address it and talk to them about it. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth, thank you so much for uh, your phone call and your question, and at least you know taking those first steps to trying to heal not only yourself uh, and your family. Uh, we are out of time, but I, I wanted to thank um, both Dr. Nikisha Riggins and Dr. Daniel Harrison for talking to us. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you thank for you. having us. Finally tonight, the holiday season is upon us. And for most of us, that means ripping and running the streets for holiday feasts, parties, and gift shopping. But this is also the season to take a breath and consider checking in, even visiting the loved ones you promised to visit all year long, but never seem to get around to doing it, especially the older loved ones in our lives. Think about it. And do it now before it's too late. As my mother always says, we're not going to stay. That's the Daily Drum for this Wednesday, November 15th. I'm Harold Fisher. Good night. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.